Welcome to the Spiritual Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Mary Beth, and I am thrilled to introduce you to my special guest today. You're going to just love him. His name's Jonathan Asley. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm good, thank you. How about yourself? So good. I'm so excited to have you on here. I'm going to read your bio. Oh, goodness. No, you don't need to read it. Are you sure? <laughs> Okay, yeah. well, you guys, just let me tell you, he is a celebrity in the relationship coaching world. He's a student of A Course in Miracles, which is the title of this. This is why I wanted him to come on and, yes, teach you guys and teach me because I'm still trying to get through it. I'm still a student. And it's he's really good at, you know, teaching others how to heal themselves. He's been through a lot of grief. A lot of tragedy i'm going to let him tell his own story and how he transmuted it now he helps other people heal and that's a beautiful thing that's what it's all about right amen okay so jonathan wherever you want to start let's let's tell the viewers a little bit about your background and like your pre let's let's start with pre-spiritual transformation jonathan well well thank you and, and and folks if you're watching this you know i know this isn't about me this is about you so if if any of this can relate to you i i hope it does um you know i would say my journey began in 2005 after turning 40 and going through a divorce uh, i found myself out in the dating marketplace which was rather interesting you know i guess now almost you know 20 years ago um and and I, I lost my corporate, my high-end job. I was going through a divorce and all the emotional effects of a divorce and losing your corporate job and couldn't find work. And I got addicted to drugs and alcohol to numb the pain. And in addition, I got addicted to online dating. Um, and and I, I bring this up because I had no idea this was gonna end up being my vocation at some point in my life, this, if you will, addiction. And I remember the movie, The Secret came out, I believe it was 2006 and I watched it and I go, God, this resonates with me. I mean, it's like, it just, it's like, it's so resonated with me. And I actually, you know, 15 years prior, I read the book, uh, You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. Yes. And okay. back then it used to be called metaphysics, you know, now it's called spiritual, but not religious kind of thing. <laughs> um, so um, I, 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 I recognize that, you know, I felt like this vibrational, you know, just it resonates, you know, like a tuning fork. It just resonated with me. So I began doing personal development work, self-help work, spiritual work. I mean, I began listening to Wayne Dyer and Joe Dispenza and Abraham Hicks and Marianne Williamson, which eventually led to the Course in Miracles that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And why I'm sharing this with everyone is that uh, depending on where you're at in your journey, and the reason why it's called a journey is life isn't a destination. You know, life is an experience. And and if you're a spiritual person and you believe that we have multiple lifetimes, if you will, or multiple chances to come back and do this in a different form. And and um, there's even theories that we go back and just do the same thing over and over like Groundhog Day, um, just with different awareness each time. Um, you know, the idea is to not, I, I think, the idea is to find inner peace, mm. I believe, mm. inner peace. And what gets in our way oftentimes is our childhood wounds and our adult traumas and the attachment to the wound. And very few people actually spend time healing the wounds that have happened in their lives. And so then they, you know, the definition of insanity, you know, what is it? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results particularly in the relationship realm. And, you know, my message is, is to encourage individuals to do work on themselves, to have what is known as awareness or enlightenment, or, you know, just it's, it's an awareness is simply, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna use what Wayne Dyer, I once read or watched in a Wayne Dyer video. You're walking down a street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. You fall in, you're lost, you're helpless, but it isn't my fault. 
it takes forever to get a, get out you know the checked second chapter is you're walking down the same street there's a deep hole in the sidewalk you see it this time you fall in you're lost you're helpless but it still isn't your fault it takes a long time to get out chapter three in this story you're walking down the same street there's a deep hole in the sidewalk this time you see it you fall in you don't stay that long you get out quickly the next chapter is you walk down the street you see a hole in the sidewalk you walk around it and the next chapter is you, you walk down another street the point is the holes in our sidewalk are our triggers there are wounds there are judgments there are they are our resentments our guilt our shame that's all the holes in our sidewalk awareness is simply going i see the hole okay that's what awareness is i just see the hole and and i fall in and i know it's my responsibility in other words it's not someone else's fault the minute you point the finger at someone else then you're giving away your sovereignty your power but seeing the whole is awareness. Now, if you can stop and walk around it, well, now you're reaching ninja level. <laughs> right. And then if you can avoid the street altogether, you had a, you're at supreme being, but you die at that point. You get <laughs> you're to a master. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I love that poem. Um, my mom had sent that to me a long, long time ago. Probably was a teenager. And I was fortunate enough that I had a mom who was into all this you know, spiritual consciousness stuff and all the people you listed. Um, um, well, with the exception of like Abraham Hicks, but like Wayne Dyer and all, they're, they're all my people too. Louise Hay. I mean, Abraham Hicks, I love. I, I just met my mom didn't know who Abraham Hicks got it, was. Got it, got it, got it. I was like, she doesn't like. And and by the way, Abraham <laughs> Hicks is not for everyone either. You know, that's, True. that's uh, you know, many of, here's the thing about, and I apologize for interrupting, Mary. No worries. But, um, you know, Whomever you, I, I look at every spiritual guru teacher is not the supreme being coming back to that, mm -hmm. that notion. It's just, there might be something in each person's perspective that can help shape your own perspective. Mm -hmm. um, Even a little so, nugget, a little nugget of information here, something there. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and the, the truth is, you know, there is a lot of talk about um, where the spiritual path might be bypassing mm -hmm. the real deep rooted pain. And so um, you take a, a person like Jeff Brown, who wrote Grounded Spirituality. He wrote uh, Uncommon Bond. He wrote Harculations, Heartulations. You know, his, his, his philosophy is get to the deep rooted wound that exists in a person. Usually that's been cultivated from childhood or some significant trauma and you you know not using spiritual bypass to overcome it that's where a lot of some people would criticize spiritual work right as a bypass i i view it a little bit differently and so i'm a big proponent of of I don't want to say the word therapy per se, because I think there are a lot of people that spend endless years in therapy and don't really generate results. Yeah. I do believe in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is usually more laser focused working on something. I'm a big proponent of workshops like the Hoffman process mm -hmm. or insight Institute to laser focus. Um, where I think spirituality is, is, is really connecting with I believe everybody has a divine, a divinity, if you will. They have a higher self. They have a knowing that goes beyond our physical body. And so to me, spirituality, if you will, is a connection to that divine self, that higher self. That's, that's what it is for me. And the more we tap into that, and you can use the principles of an Abraham or Joe Dispenza or whatever in the sense of rewiring your, Joe Dispenza is all about rewiring yes. your brain as an example. I just observed that life is just a little bit easier. It's a little bit more fulfilling. It's a little bit more um, content. And, and when a human can reach a point of living in presence, which is really 
fucking hard to do it's is really, to be present. Really hard. Yeah. Because we have that like and if and whether you like Eckhart Tolle or not, the power of now. Yeah. Um humans have a propensity of living in the past or projecting the future and not knowing what it's like to be present. Mm -hmm. And think about this in relationships. You know, a lot of couples, when they're communicating, they're not listening to the other person. They're waiting to respond. They're already thinking in the future of what they want to say, instead of just taking in what this person is saying to me. And just, and, and then learning how to acknowledge what another person says. That's the other thing. Humans are terrible communicators to one another. Most humans talk at each other instead of with each other. Active listening is a definite lost art. <laughs> it's not a skill. Well, I don't think have. it was ever an art. I don't, well, I don't think it was something ever. Well, I'm not, I don't mean to criticize that. Um, but I, I want to acknowledge, I don't think it was ever an art, you know, I think it was in the sense of something lost. I think it's, it's, um, and I don't know what it was like to live a thousand years ago. I think when you're in survival sure. mode, it's a whole different way of being. I think it's a, it's an art that's not taught. It's not, it's an that's art that exactly isn't right. influenced. It's an art that isn't encouraged. Because think of when you're a child, your parents are basically yelling at you, you you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, or they're praising you to the nth degree. And there's, you know, and I'm not to suggest that our job is to have real deep conversation with our children, but okay, but a child is a perfect example. We have adult beings with a child's sense of, with a child's capacity to listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so it's an art or it's it's more of a a skill to become to become a listener and actually what that does is that elevates you to grown-up status because children don't listen you know because they're all they're in their own world and it's great to be in your own world i think we need time to be in our own world and play with that reverence of just beginner's mind and enthusiasm um at the same time, it's I think it's important to be present, especially when you're having human interactions with people. There should be so many classes. But I feel like I'm dominating the time here. No, so I that's okay. I was I was just gonna say you just made me think there should be so many classes. I've thought this before, but classes that children learn, and one of them should be about being present, active listening, meditation. You know, we need like just to learn how to be present. Like they should be taught in school. And said, well, we're, I think that would be like a great beginning, you know, communication well, skills you, aren't taught. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm processing whether I think that's a good idea or not. And the reason why, while the human brain is forming, you know, um, I don't think children are patient enough to actually sit and do meditation. I think it's almost impossible at a child's experience. And I'm not suggesting that isn't the case. Um, but certainly for the adults that are watching this, um, which mostly are, um, I would venture to say, you know, going to a retreat center and not talking for a week, imagine that. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like having no cell phone for a week, what would, or, you know, no you know, phone for a week. What would life be like if you were just simply in a space like that, I've yet to do it, by the way. Yeah, I haven't either. I just think like if I had been taught these things when I was younger, I'd be better at it now because I definitely probably I yeah, I definitely feel like I would have I could have used that practice. <laughs> so I, I made my children. I'm sorry. I made my children listen to Tony Robbins in the car. And, you know, it, by the way, it was they were still yelling and screaming in the back, by the way. Uh, what was interesting is. By listening it through repetition over and over and over again, it's so funny to hear my 27 year old son kind of recite some of that stuff. Uh, yes. Because even though they weren't actively listening, it was sunk in. in. It's sunk in. Yeah. You know, the, and my son was raised on Abraham Hicks, and um, it's awesome. But I do feel like he's like a he's a badass manifester, and that's why. Like since he was probably three years old, I was playing it for him, and he acted like he hated it, but I know he liked it now. But okay, so you, may, I wanted to circle back to spiritual bypassing a little bit because what you said is so true. I'm definitely, I was guilty of that initially because 
when we first start the like 2006 too, when I learned about the secret, there was a lot of information yeah. left out, you know, it was really all like a positive thinking. And, you know, they didn't talk about taking action. And as we know, now there's no law of attraction without taking action. And I was just like, okay, I got to think positive thoughts all the time. Cancel the negative, cancel, cancel, cancel. And I was just so afraid of my own thoughts for a while. Then I started suppressing things, you know, I started to ignore if I felt bad when really, like you said, the real spirituality, what I call real is not denying our feelings. We have to feel our feelings and because they're still in our body and our our body is basically our subconscious mind. So you guys, if you, if you suppress your feelings, you're not, I mean, they're still, they're still there in your body. They, it will wreak havoc later in life. You know, we have, we, we, we hold all of those emotions. And I wanted to get into to transition into your son, actually Connor, who died at only age 19 and how you were, how you've used the horrible, you know, I can't even imagine. I cannot even imagine my son. He's, about to turn 21. I just don't even, I don't even let my mind go there. So tell, walk us through that and how you got to where you are now from obviously sure, you, it sure. was horrible. So, um, well, thank you, Mary Beth. So um, for those that didn't know before, she just mentioned that uh, in 2018, I lost my 19 year old son to, um, we'll call it an accident. And, um, what was interesting was I had been, I actually had joined a um, Course of Miracles study group about three months before his passing. Mm. And what was interesting was about a month before his passing, it was all about, we are, we are not a body, you know, it was like life after death, that sort of thing. And, uh, or, or, or what are or more, not life after death. That isn't the accurate uh, representation more about our spirit and the differentiating between our, our say mortal lives and our spiritual lives. And so by the time he passed, I had an interesting awareness that, um, you know, yes, his mortal soul, immortal body is gone. You know, what we physically see, but there, that, that, we are all energy and our soul, I believe, or our spirit or our divinity is an energy and he's just dancing in a different realm. So, you know, other than the initial pain, I said, okay, Connor would not want me to suffer one day. You know, I mean, I just know him. He'd say, fuck, I don't want you to suffer over this. So I made a conscious choice. Um, by the time we had his funeral, I said, look, I could grieve with suffering or I could grieve with love. And what does it mean to grieve with love? Because, you know, suffering is, suffering in this particular case would be either trying to change what happened. That's kind of like going, I'd like to go back in the past and, you know, in a time machine to change what had happened. That's that's one form of suffering. Or another form of suffering is like wishing he was back for my you know, in my present life kind of thing. And I'm like, so first was acceptance that this is real. He's gone, but his spirit isn't gone. And just on a side note, I, I I'm going to share with everybody that I. I apologize. I can't remember if it was the day, the evening that he passed or the following day, for whatever reason, my memory lapses here. As I was walking into the complex where I live, there's this kind of river, not a river, but a pond and foliage and palm trees and just really beautiful landscaping. And I see this butterfly flying by me, a yellow butterfly. I'm like, oh, just kind of noticed it, no big deal. And then uh, the next day I'm leaving the complex and I see this yellow butterfly again following me. I'm like, it was now following me. I'm like, I just, I just noticed it. The next day, and I happen to live on the, you know, like the fourth or fifth floor of a uh, building. There's a yellow butterfly right in front of my balcony. And I'm like, that is fucking Connor. Like, I mean, there's no like doubt in my mind. His spirit was stopping by to say hi i just got full body goosebumps <laughs> and 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 this went on for weeks 
I mean, like in different formats. And in the five years, I can't tell you how many times a yellow butterfly flashes by me, cruises by me. And there was one time I was riding my bicycle on the beach and at, at about a pace of like, say, six or seven miles an hour. For a two mile stretch, a yellow butterfly followed me the entire way. I love it. I mean, now it's, it's one thing if they're, you know, staying in their own vortex, but this one followed me the entire way. So is that him? You know, I, you know, like, do I know definitively? No, but in my heart of hearts, I, so this is a form of grieving with love is that I take the experience of my son and hold those memories, those experiences with love and not loss. And what I mean to say is what I lost. Um, do I have moments of crying my head off or sadness? Absolutely. It is important, as you said earlier, to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I don't believe we should fall into the hole of our feelings and just stay there. You know, I think we, we, and, and, you know, I'm not anyone who's watching this that's lost a child or a dear loved one or, you know, even a pet. I'm not here to even remotely suggest that feeling sad is, is not valid, but I do believe suffering is an individual choice. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Um, and you can't will yourself into this shit. You know I mean? You can't just, you know, and, and I, this is where maybe some teachings are, have that spiritual bypass association. For me, I, that's where I went. I just went to acceptance and love. Okay. And my invitation for everyone is to, and, and in any space in their life, in any capacity is acceptance and then say, what would love do? How would love respond? And so it it actually, his passing motivated me to writing my book, which you can see behind me, but it's called What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? I began writing this book um, two months after he passed and I published it nine months after he passed. And, and I'm, I'm sharing with you, I put my energies into what would love do. And I actually have a podcast called the what would love do podcast. And the idea is how can we approach things from the eyes of love and wh whatever that means for you. And you started a foundation you know? for Connor as well. And well, to the extent that I collect, yeah, I mean, it's not this grand foundation. It's just simply <laughs> I donate money in yeah. his name, you know, to the Hoffman process insight or scholarships and that sort of thing. I just do it in his name. It's not yeah. a, I'm just going to say, it's not a, I was going to call it a 401k. It's not a 501 BC or whatever the it's called. It's not that kind of foundation. Well, it's still a beautiful way to, to remember him. And um, you, you know yeah. what you said earlier, gosh, you know, just really hit home because, you know, hopefully I die before my son. Uh, I have one son and, and, I would, it's exactly what you said. Do I want him to focus on my death? Hell no, hell no. I want him to only remember my life and all the good the good parts of it, celebrate the, the time I was alive. I don't want him ever wasting any of his days being, you know, thinking of my death and how I died or, or, or the fact that I'm not there anymore. And so I agree, like if we can get to, and I know it's hard, like you said, it's hard. Everybody's different. Everybody's gonna grieve differently. Well, there's there's, a when a parent passes, okay, so this is where it gets challenging. And I mean, we're kind of, let's, since we're bringing up, you know, loss, because Course in Miracles, you know, really encourages everyone to look at it from a spiritual perspective. You know, God forbid you're a young child and you lost a parent. I mean, we have this dependency on our parents, okay? And, um, and that, can be incredibly emotionally traumatic, especially if you've lost your significant support system. So to that extent, I could see that having repercussions that could be very dramatic for that child as they become an adult. Mm -hmm. When an adult parent, adult person loses their parents, it's kind of the natural order of things. You know, uh, if, you, if any parent reaches 80 plus, you know, it's kind of the natural order of things. Um, when you lose a child, there's a different energy. It's like our job as parents is to protect our children. And it's like, 
fuck, I failed at this, you know? So there's a different level of shame that's associated extra. with it. Yeah, extra. And then then if you're a young person who just got married and you're in your 30s or 40, 40s and you lose a spouse, like here you've given your heart to another person in, in a way that, you know, for the first time, maybe you, you experience love in a different way and that can be traumatic or God forbid you're in your 50s and 60s and you lose a, a, a spouse or someone, you know? So each type of loss has its own unique flavors the real question is do we want to grieve with suffering or do we want to grieve right. with love in every one of those cases um and that's the you know that's what a course in miracles advocates is the, the idea by the way folks if you've never read the course in miracles the the concept of a miracle is simply how can i choose love like that's the miracle how or not or choosing love that's actually the miracle is actually do it's not how to do it the book teaches you a lot of, it has a lot of different lessons to get you into that space of if choosing love over fear choosing love over ego choosing love over guilt and shame and and resentments and comparisons it's just choosing love and forgiveness for example is one of the the, the tenets of the book is the concept of forgiveness and forgiveness simply means for giving love. At least that's my version of it. For giving, forgiveness, for giving love. So, so the question becomes, how can I how can I be more loving every single day? How can I be more loving? How can I be in a space of love in a mortal world? Um and sometimes we fail miserably at it. I mean, I had a woman write me a nasty message on a YouTube video. And I was like, my venom came out. I was like, ah, you know, um, and, and I'm like, damn, dude, just, I, and I actually, it was one of those, I'm about to hit send. And I'm like, Stop okay, yourself. I got it. Yeah. I caught myself because what would love do? And then what I wrote was simply, you know, um, thank you for sharing your point of view. I, you know, appreciate it. Something like that. That's and what tough. was interesting, I know. Yeah, and then years. what was interesting, I know. And what was interesting is a woman commented right below it, Jonathan, you're a class act mm. because I would have went off on this person. So um, when we get triggered, know, that really just shows like, okay, well, maybe I'm not completely healed in this area. Or, I mean, I do think also our vibrations always going up and down and we we just it might things hit us differently on different days different times <laughs> it just is what it is well we're there's you know you can't predict I, that's the thing about a trigger they they are invitations to work on your shit is the way i look at them Absolutely. so um, um you know when we're at the when we're at the hoffman process something i did some years ago and folks if you're not familiar with it i invite you to google the hoffman institute uh dot com or whatever it is mm -hmm. and um it's probably an org. Um, and and triggers are like your friend. It's like, hey, dude, wake up. You got to work on something today. Yeah. And um, or or dude or do that. Um, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I was just having a conversation. Why do people call me dude? I'm, I'm like a senior citizen now. Uh, <laughs> people still call you dude? Yeah, I was at the, I was getting my haircut yesterday and the stylist said, dude, I'm like, it was just funny. But we've been calling women guys for so long. It's like, hey guys, you know, it's like this colloquial. Uh, I, I do that so, all the time on my videos. I'm like, hey guys, hey, like I call everybody I guys know. and I heard we're not supposed to do that anymore, but I think I'm going to just. I know myself. the cancel culture is going to get you. I know. Well, part of why. Just to talk about like when I first saw, maybe it was three years ago when I first saw one of your videos and I was like, okay. and you were like the same video, you're being all spiritual and you're also like, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> I was like, yes, this is one of my kind. Like, you know, you're very unfiltered and also very vulnerable about the things you admit when you did something wrong. Like when you got addicted to dating apps again, you were like, ah, oh, but you caught yourself. And that's the thing, you guys, we, we all, if, as long as you catch yourself, we're all human. We can do some little backsliding, I think it's called, but, you know, catch yourself and get out of it really quickly. So it's interesting because when you said, you know, you called me spiritual, you know, to that extent, 
you were talking in a way that I would only be able to find. No, and I get that. And I, and I, and I'm only pausing as I reflect upon it. You know, I, 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 I swim with people who are like so much more spiritual than I am. So um, I, 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 I'm recognizing that to me and why I, I wanted to talk about this for a second. Awareness to me is again, that connection with your, whether we call it our higher self, our spiritual self, our divinity, whatever, you know, source energy, universe, God, whatever resonates for you, because every person mm -hmm. is different. I, I call it God, universe, spirit. Uh, someone called it Gus. Okay. Oh, so instead yeah. of God, it's I've Gus, <laughs> God, universe, spirit. So, you know, I, I'm a human being riddled with with ego and flaw. I don't, well, let's not use the word flaws because then that makes me out to be flossom. I always say I'm flossom. <laughs> flossom. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I like that. Flossom. So why I'm, I'm sharing this is that our humanness is kind of, is, is kind of like the salt and the pepper and the cayenne and the, and the basil and the rosemary, you know, that you put into a, a sauce or a soup or something that gives it flavor. Our humanness is what gives us flavor. Our, our insecurities or dare I say flaws, our neuroses, our, our, our quirks, our, our quirks, you know, um, and, and learning to accept a person's humanness is really the, the, the you know, and I'm, by the way, I'm not here to suggest that you have to subject yourself to torture. I mean, some people's humanness is rooted in so much past trauma mm -hmm. or or self-centric behavior that they're not really present. And I'm, I'm by the way, and I'm saying this in the context of relationships mostly. Um, there are certainly people stuck in the past. There are certainly people that are self-centric. By the way, I use the word self-centric instead of selfish or narcissistic because I believe it's a it's a myopic thing. It's a it's a unconscious protection mechanism because they don't really have a capacity to go beyond their self. Um the work at least the, the spiritual work is, or personal, I, that's why I always say personal development, self-help and spiritual work, because whether, you know, therapy or working on oneself is really that catching yourself before you fall into the hole. Or you fell into the hole and how quickly can you get out? Mm -hmm. And the work in many cases is just taking ownership that, I was responsible for this experience because even though 97, like somebody else could be for argument's sake, 97% at fault. You could say it was the other person's fault, but you had 3% in it. Mm -hmm. And that 3% is really a hundred percent of it. The pro Because if you make it 97% about the other person and take no ownership, then you are guilty of victim consciousness. And at least here in the United States, we are suckling on the nipple of victim consciousness. I mean, Absolutely. it is just an ap epidemic of not taking personal responsibility. So um, awareness is going, even if it's a hundred, even if it's 75% someone else, or excuse me, 95, 75, 95, whatever taking a hundred percent and just only focusing on your ownership. See, that's what I mean. You focus on your ownership and that's all you need to do. Because when you focus on someone else, you're giving them your power. And self-love is all about self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-reliance, uh, self, uh, uh, any other self-word other than the self, self selfish one. It also is selfish because you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're no benefit to anyone else. Yeah. And that's a good transition into um, like what I know you teach as a, a relationship coach. I don't know if since I didn't read your thing. Um, so you're midlife dating coach for women. Uh, that's yeah. how I found you on YouTube. Yeah. Like you, that's your specialty. So you guys, if, if, you know, that's, you, you definitely want to look up Jonathan Asley, A-S-L-A-Y 
Yeah, on, my name is right there somewhere. Oh yeah, his name's right there. And yeah, he's he's a he does you do tons of content, so tons of free content. Definitely go find him because he's like you and you say you've said this before and i totally agree like you're like the big brother you know you're gonna tell it like it is you're very direct and that's the that's what drew me to you um because your personality is just you're you tell it like it is without because i don't think people really learn or change much when you're using kid gloves you know <laughs> not you well, can't be a coach and and not tell it like it is you just you, if you sugarcoat things too much it doesn't really lead to much change yeah, I, I think there's a lot of content where it's especially in the divine feminine and the divine masculine screen, you know, it's all about this goddess fucking energy and shit like that. But, you know, humans, you know, there there is a lot more to a human being than just their masculine or feminine energy. And, you know, whether we we call it the caveman experience of men are the provider protectors and women are the nurturers or our biology where men have 50 million times more testosterone than a woman and they have more estrogen. The true makeup of an individual is the childhood wounds and traumas that they experience in life. Um, and and the adult wounds and their socioeconomic status and their cultural experiences and and the choices that they've made as adults so you you know to to narrow it down to you know some testosterone or or masculine or feminine is 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 negating the real breath of a human being and so to the extent that i tell it like it is a real um I just believe I, I want to be fair to everyone. Whether my I don't consider myself, you know, to me, um, it's not real. It's just does it resonate with you? Because it's merely a perspective. You know, this thing we call life, this thing we call, you know, this journey, as I said in the beginning about life, it's all a perspective. Everybody has a different prism that they view the world through. Mm -hmm. So I want to be clear. I'm not right or wrong. I'm not the truth. It's just, you know, it's the truth according to Jonathan. I'll tell you, honestly, it's the truth according to me, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's your truth. You know, um, there is a community out there called MGTOW, men going their own way. There's a community called the red pill community, which they believe they're spouting the truth and MGTOW spouting the truth and the divine goddess and the divine feminine think they're spouting the truth. And I'm here to say it's, it's mine isn't the truth. It just happens to be my perspective, which is my, tr my truth, but it's not necessarily the truth. Well, and okay? you're attracting people to your channel who um, it resonates with them on a vibrational level. Like Abraham Hicks, I've heard Abraham Hicks say that there's really between men and women, there's like not really a vibrational difference. It's it's kind of like you said, it's the experiences, it's just, you know, how the culture, things like that, that that makes the big difference. Um, but vibration. Yeah, read, read the book, If the Buddha Dated, oh. chapter nine. Chapter nine is, I believe it's chapter nine, I could be mistaken, but it's all about how really close men and women are, you know, forgetting the the the, the chemical differences wow. uh, per se, but I think it's um, spiritual equality is the chapter, one set of rules for men and women. So when you're actually dating on a spiritual path, it's not about hyper-focusing on the differences because it is differences that creates friction. You know, that's the problem. We're operating from a, a mindset, at least in the dating relating realm, is from already a pre preconceived friction. Like cr criticism, of, like we're being like critical. Well, no, well, like men are, you know, men are provider protectors oh, and they're okay. supposed, women just sits back in her feminine energy and she doesn't have to ask a man out on a date and she doesn't have to pay for a date and she doesn't have to do anything. She just should lay back in her feminine energy and just let a man do all the work. I'm like, that, you know, like that really. I've never way, listened to those a, people. I've never heard anybody that, say that. I guess I must not be attracted was, to that. Yeah, but if that was such great advice, why do we have over 100 million singles in the United States, you know? So 
So when you're dating on a spiritual path, it's how can I connect with another human being not based on a preconceived, like in buying the way, paying for dates is a perfect example of this. This is such an ingrained expectation. It's such an ingrained expectation that there's criticism. God forbid if a man says, hey, do you want to split it or this or that? And, and I know we could all say, well, but they asked me out. Well, yeah, men, because that's the tradition. But from a spiritual perspective, you throw out all that crap and say, how can I get to know you as a human being without the gender expectations? Because that's really, that's the next level of what I believe is the evolution of where relationships could go is how are we going to get to know each other beyond the expectation? Because well, I have an expectation there. Like if I, and I I'll be honest, you do. If, if I ask a guy out, I would not expect him to pay if I was, but if he asked me out, I would, I would kind of, I would say if he wants me to see him as a, like, cause he'd be investing in the relationship. That's how I would see it. Like he, he would show me that he's interested and if he didn't pay for me, I'd be like, okay, well, I guess he just wants to be, um, have a more of a friendship. It's kind of like in the beginning, in the, you know, and then of course, later on the relationship anyway, evolves. I get it. I'm just telling you yeah, from a it, spiritual path, that expectation could cripple you when you're yeah. dating from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. I just think like, it's just shows a woman. By the way, when you think, all right, only because I'm going to give you shit now. Um, so we've, we've already had, had this conversation. I already knew I know, you were going to give this me shit. conversation before, but <laughs> if anyone's gotten this far in the video, um, so here's the thing I get from an on given that 90, probably 90% of all first dates are happening through some level of online connection. You're meeting True. a total stranger men and in, uh, typically initiate the date. Okay. But if you take the word date out and say they initiate the meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's say. Like, it'd be like, maybe I'm going to give you a different analogy. I want you to think about two business people, two attorneys that are going to meet to discuss building a, a practice together. Okay. I want you to think of it like this. Two sovereign beings, and they can be opposite gender. Okay. They can be opposite gender. They're meeting and they're discussing the idea of exploring a business partnership together. Just because one person made the overture doesn't mean that they are the leader in this particular relationship. It's when two sovereign beings meet with one another, they each are equal, okay? That's what the chapter is about, okay? And so, and again, I get the whole, it feels better when the guy pays, but I'm talking, this is a, this is a conversation about spirituality. Mm -hmm. well, I guess if they said that, it in that way, like, a, well, meet, no, no. a meeting and the, instead I, of I a know, date, but everybody it calls a date, things. but every, but let's get real. A first date is really a first meeting. You have no idea whether or not you like this person yet. I have no nothing about you yet. So planting, but, but some women will, Jonathan, I spent all this money getting dressed up and doing all this stuff to get ready to make him like me. Well, then you're, then, then you're making a bigger gigantic mistake trying to do something to make someone like you. That's not the way you operate from a spiritual perspective. And that doesn't mean you wear your pajamas and don't shave your armpits either kind of thing. Um, and I was being ba -dum -bum. And if um, I'm not interested in somebody like on a, at a first meeting, I would not let them pay. I would not allow anybody to pay. If I already knew, this is the last time I'm I, seeing I, this I person. Get, I get that this is the tradition, okay? Mm -hmm. But we're really talking about from a spiritual perspective. I'm, I'm, I'm shifting the narrative. I get this is our, you know, Matthew Hussey once said, if a man isn't raised right, if he doesn't um, pay, and a woman isn't raised right, if she didn't offer to pay. And, and if he accepts her offer, you see, all of a sudden there's judgment. You see, in the spiritual realm, there's no judgment. There's no expectation. You have even told me, I, if a guy asked me on a date and he split it, I would never see him again. I put him in the friend zone. That's not a spiritual way of dating. I know I'm, someone in a box I so that early. I'm totally programmed in this way. Yeah. I'm programmed okay. traditional and it's really never happened to me before. I'm, I'm just, I'm just you, my imagination that I would be like, I, I would be yeah, less. If you want to shift to a spiritual way, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Would, you. Well, it's never happened to me. I've never been tested, but I would, I, I just know myself enough. I'm very self-aware, Jonathan. I would be less attracted 
to the guy who didn't pay than if he did pay. Cause it's kind of sexy when somebody pays. I mean, you know what I like when a woman says to me, and I've had this happen many a time, Jonathan, I just appreciate your generosity. Can I treat? I've had this happen multiple times. On first, on first date? date? On first dates. I've had this happen multiple times. You know what? I, it is so refreshing to be with a guy who is conscious and aware stuff. I just want to show my appreciation. Would you allow this for me? Mm -hmm. And I and not put in the friend zone kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know what that tells me about that woman? She's fucking partnership material. Like that elevates her to like that puts her up on a pedestal, you know, status because she says the words, I appreciate you. And I want to show you my appreciation. Mm -hmm. And and I usually would never allow it. Um, I've only actually allowed it once when it's happened. And I'm going to tell you, it's happened, I think, four or five times in my life. Um, but I'm coming back to spirituality. If you really want to connect with a partner, then think of with a partner, then think of it like two business people getting together, not from a business perspective, but I'm talking, we're gonna, if we're going to explore something, how are we going to co-create this together? Yeah. I love that co-creation. You know, so the, Conscious so the relationship. Why, yeah. So the reason why I use attorneys as an example or, or accountants or doctors that are going to form a practice together, it's not based on gender. It's based on what you bring to the table. And by the way, you might have one partner that's great at customer acquisition and the other person might be great at admin. So they leverage their strengths with to one another. Um, and that's the way I want to encourage people to view relationships going forward. The problem with relationships today, they hyper-focus on attraction and romance mm -hmm. and not enough on compatibility, meaning shared values, blendable lifestyles, emotional maturity. We've been indoctrinated that it's attractive. You even use the word, it's more attractive when a guy does that. But you see, attraction, romance should be reserved for couples who are already in a relationship, not as an entry point to relationship, because we have now learned through observation that chemistry doesn't equal relationship success. No, it does relationship not. <laughs> success is built through compatibility. And so, um, and it's more important to do your due diligence. That's what I teach in my private coaching is basically a, an evolution of due diligence. So you make a better choice because most humans have broken pickers. Well, let's talk about conscious relationships for a minute. Um, like, what is your definition of a conscious relationship? A woman who offers to pay on the first date. But ah! I'm Done. We're in a uh, relationship. And by the way, I say that tongue in cheek, but you know what that demonstrates? By the way, you know what that demonstrates? I said that jokingly. I want every, by the way, I'm probably pissing off a lot about your, your audience right at this point. But you That's know what okay. that demonstrates? That demonstrates a level of generosity because it says, I'm not going to stick to traditional norms, okay? Mm -hmm. Traditional norms, okay? And everybody could say, well, Jonathan, biology says we need to have traditional norms, not on the spiritual plane. You don't. Okay. So a spiritual partnership, a spiritual connection, a soul connection is is one where two sovereign beings in other words they most likely have done their work before they get to this space mm -hmm. of relationship with someone they've they've they they've learned non-violent communication techniques or what i prefer to call compassionate communication techniques they've done work to heal their childhood wounds and traumas they are crystal clear on the type of relationship they seek but most importantly, they operate not from a place of fear and ego, okay, but from a place of love. And when two more evolved, awakened souls meet, what's fascinating, I, and in fact, I interviewed a couple, um, I, I'm, I'm interviewing, I'm interviewing a lot of soul connection couples. You know what? The guy is short, he's bald, he's chubby, you know, and she's madly in love with them or, you know, like they're all the all the traditional or the the stereotypical ego stuff gets washed away based on looks because it's really connecting with someone at their heart. Right. 
And so, uh, because I can't tell you how many times I get messages, Jonathan, I met the most perfect guy. He's perfect on paper and everything. And he's so wonderful, but I'm just not attracted to him. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? When you meet your soul connection, I mean, they could look like Roseanne Barr, or they could look like John Goodman. And I'm she looks pretty good these days. Those two. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and, and I'm just saying, or I, I'm trying to think of, you know, I know in other words, and you think they're, yeah. and again, please forgive me. I, I mean, and you see them as, as, um, as Scarlett Johansson and Johansson or, or Johansson and um, um, Brad Pitt, right, you know, right like on. that's what they look like to you. Yeah. They so, can do that wrong when you, when, when you have a soul connection, not just chemistry, like you said, chemistry scares me these days. <laughs> like we've talked about that before run, but um, soul connection, you, you don't see the flaws because you have that it's, it's completely higher level. It's, it's spiritual. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, um, or, or you see the flaws. And so long as if we're going to use the word flaws, and again, let's be clear, there is no such thing as it's flawable. What did you call it? Flossom. Flossom. It's flossom. It's that you love them in even their humanness. Now, that doesn't mean you accept bad behavior. It doesn't mean that you should um, tolerate um, somebody who's stuck in the past, someone who's a complainer. But I said, but. And most likely that person who already shows up more evolved isn't going to be stuck in the past or or rigid or rigid ideologies or stuff like that. Um, but at the end of the day, we all, we're humans and we're going to do things differently. Like, okay. Like my biggest pet peeve is I believe forks down. Okay. Uh, in the dishwasher. Okay. I'm this is a perfect analogy. So oh, I'm, I'm, I'm always forks up and forks knives, up. knives and so, down. Yeah. Well, but, but the idea is you're touching the part you're going to eat with, with your fingers when you're picking it up. So that's my belief system, right? Well, that's not enough to make a deal breaker out of something, right. okay? Even when people do things differently. That's not to suggest that you might have, you know, a perspective that could be more efficient, you know, like, and, and be able to listen to your partner's way of doing things. Um, what I'm talking about is we all have differences. It's learning to appreciate. And what I'm about to say is really the critical piece in all of this. Very few couples, this isn't true with soul couples, but very few couples actually spend a significant amount of time in each day acknowledging and appreciating their partner. Like, mm -hmm. like you should literally wake up and look at that person in the eye and go, fuck, I am the most blessed human being on the planet to be with you. And actually saying those words are not necessarily in that order, but saying that a lack of appreciation is one of the primary reasons why couples, either the expressing of the appreciation or the actual, in, I'm spitting, the actual feeling of appreciation. And when, a, when spiritual couples to get together, they tend to operate in such a space of gratitude mm -hmm. and they acknowledge their partner in a gr grateful way every single day. And, and, that's why I see so few couples actually act, having some amazing experience because living in a space of gratitude for, you know, 23 hour, hours out of the day or whatever it is, you know, I mean, I'm, when, I mean when I say whatever it is, I know there's 24 hours in the day, <laughs> but spending a majority of your time when you're with someone in a space of gratitude is what's often lacking because we operate from a place of what can I get and what can I give? So when you expect a man to pay for a date, you're coming at it from a place of what can I get? And I was just fucking with you. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> no, and I, I take, like I said, I realize that I'm full of that programming and um, yeah. I haven't even had to deal with it. It's never happened to me. I can, I'm just using my imagination. I can only imagine how I would feel. I've, I've never been in that situation. But, By the way, folks, we had this big debate about this a <laughs> month ago. So I'm just- Oh yeah, it's, it's just, it's like continues, it continues. And I can't, I, I, I can't change. I, I can change. It just, like I said, uh, I've, never, <laughs> I've never been tested, but okay. um, so like a conscious relationship, I like for me, it's, it's, you've got both people are 
willing and able also able to when somebody's has an issue and you know you're having a bad day i'm your partner you know i i help you with it instead of you know make it make things about me you know we help each other grow we help each other expand you know there it's 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 different than in a in a a non-conscious really an unconscious relationship where, where you don't really help each other very much you're not helping each other grow it's almost like um it's not so as think back, well let me jump in so think sure. back hundreds if not thousands of years ago couples it's 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 not even about consciousness although that is a level of what's important so up until about 50 or 100 years ago, people got married within two to two weeks to two months of knowing each other. And 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 not that I'm advocating for that. <laughs> but what's interesting about that is there was a level of all in. OK, like like, look, if I want to get laid, I got to get married. Now, that was you had to go all in. Right. Or the woman, if I want to survive, I got to get married. Yeah. Okay. So what changed is birth control changed everything. And now the ability to get physical intimacy or sex doesn't require any all in. In fact, it, it doesn't, it all it requires is to paying for a date. Um, and you know, and there's a, you know, there, you know, there's a 90% chance that most people have sex within three dates, you know, so it's not much of an investment on the guy's part anyway, but my point of going with this all in, See, when you go all in, it means I'm going to listen. If, if all it means is, look, I'm only going to date one person at a time. That's an all in. If I'm going to give you all of my attention, I'm going to give you all of my attention. If I'm if I'm serious about a relationship, I'm going to be I'm all in about being serious, you know. So today's dating. People are dating multiple people at the same time, OK, which is already dysfunctional right there you could you don't have to go all in with time effort emotions or anything you don't have to do any of that so people date now kind of like they're shoe shopping yeah. i'm gonna go to nordstrom's and i'm gonna try and guess Catalog. what i'm gonna go to nordstrom's try on a pair of shoes i'm gonna go wear those pair of shoes OK, I'm going to go return it because nordstrom has a policy well they'll return everything and i can do this every day of the week and I, or I, or I, and you bought these shoes and you buy these shoes and you're like, I know I can always go to the shoe store to get more. That's what our current dating environment is like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It lacks a sense of like, when I said those two business people that got together, they're like, look, we're going to explore this. Let's have some real serious conversations to see if we're a good fit to, to start this new law firm together. Okay. And they sign legal contracts and they get off, like they do a lot of things. It, it requires a big investment and there's a consequence for failure. There's no consequence for failure other than, you know, heartbroken feelings. Mm -hmm. And the thing is the consequence in it, there's no consequence for the person to hurt the other, feel, other person's feelings. There's no consequence to them. Because people just go. Yeah, it's not like you paid your money, bought the shoes and go, guess what? Nordstrom says, you know what? You're fucked. You wore these shoes. You don't get the money back. You're, and these are the only shoes you get to wear. Now, I get that's an outdated, antiquated way of looking at things. But the question is, are we going to go in consciously and have real serious conversations as we're exploring this together? Are we going to go ambivalently and go, well, Jonathan, if he pays for dates and he does all this, I'm going to feel more attracted. I'm fucking with you. Uh, he's going to feel more attracted. I'm going to feel more attracted to him. And I know that is so minuscule mm -hmm. in the scheme of things for you. Um, but again, when you're dating on a spiritual level, it's how am I connecting with another human being? And am I really getting to know who this person is and not say, do they like me? I'm asking the question, do I like them? So what is your definition of a miracle after reading A Course in Miracles? Um, well, what I said earlier, I feel is true. A miracle is a shift in perspective. 
Mm -hmm. Like if I could change your point of view on what we talked about, that's a miracle. That is a miracle. <laughs> that is a miracle. If I can shift your perspective. Uh, Neuroplasticity, so you reprogram okay. my brain. I'm, I'm just, but no, but it's a shift in perspective. And, and the shift is, so I told you the story, the woman who wrote this Venom post on mine, and I wrote back with equal, uh, the miracle was not, not hitting, hitting send. Hitting send. <laughs> And rewriting it from a place of love mm. and actually recognizing that this person is really hurting yeah. most likely because I know they're hurting because they wouldn't have, if it was venom that I got. That's so true. That was the miracle when I shifted from you, you know, and I have a lot of C and B words um, to, you know what? So overcoming like resentment and forgiveness is all a, a miracle in, a, yeah. in and of itself. Yeah, so overcoming uh, fear, ego, guilt, comparisons, resentment, shame, uh, anger, when you can shift to a place of love. And sometimes love is neutral. Like I could have just done nothing. That could have been the neutral yeah. post. That's also a form of love because rather than attack, I could have just ignored it. But really, I wanted to go another step. Mm -hmm. And then I got the the other woman who posted and said, wow, you're a class act. So there was love reward. coming back to me. Yeah, you yeah, got rewarded a, by yeah. the universe. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, well, that's my perspective of a miracle. Yeah, I love that. And that's what that's what I remember. Like, I still need to get back into it, but I know how important of a book it is. And just for anyone who hasn't even heard of A Course in Miracles, Jonathan, how much you know the author, wasn't she Jewish? And she like started channeling one day this book. And it, isn't it supposedly um channeled by jesus is that am i right yeah, about know, that? I, I i'll be candid with you i i know i've heard the backstory i mean it just escapes me at the moment um yeah, that's so what I thought I remembered. Um, but i think you're i think you're accurate but you know here's the thing folks the course of miracles okay i'm gonna end on this note okay um it's fucking dense I mean, it, it is, is it's dense it's dense it's dense um do it with a study group, do it with, and and I did a study group every day for three years, every morning at 8 a.m. We got on a, every day, Monday through, I mean, Monday through Sunday. That's um, I missed some days, but it was really, it was a way to connect with friends and we picked it apart and we challenged and I got to learn through other people's perspective. Don't go buy this book and think you're going to be healed. You could buy Alan Cohen's version of it with the Course in oh, Miracles. Made easy, made easy. Made I, easy. I did read so, that whole thing very quickly. Yeah. That's a very easy read. Um, so, so that I would encourage. Um, um, so that's inspiring that encourage. me to start a group. I'm, I think I, I I've started a group and then it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to try again because it was just I think it's it's an overwhelming book and um, the two people. Way, mm -hmm. The reason why every day there's 365 lessons. So mm -hmm. that's why I did it every day because there's okay. 365 lessons. I did Some people that. do it once a week and they do seven lessons at a time. Um, but here's the beauty of doing it. If you did a study group every day is you're getting to connect with friends. You're talking about something you appreciate. It's a nice way to you turn off your phones. And, oh, well, I mean, even though you might be on the phone and just connect. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, um, so anyway, that's what I have to say today. I hope this helped. Yes, it was wonderful. And Jonathan, how can people connect with you? I'm going to put your links in the show, uh, the show notes, the description box, okay. but, um, how can people connect with you? Click you on one of the work. links there. You can follow me on YouTube. You can go to my website. I mean, I've, I've got a gazillion blogs and stuff out there. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you've got something nasty to say, what I said, you, you don't say it because I, I have thin well, skin. It'll be on my uh, video, so you won't even see it unless you come look for it. I'll tell you, though. I'll, I'll it, screenshot it, it. I'll say, see, it, I was right. They think that men should pay for the date. I know. I know. <laughs> I would not By do that. Way. Uh, that would be funny though. I am, I am, I am going to shift you. I'm going to give you, I, my hope is that you have a miracle there. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, like I said, I've never been tested on it. I just can't. Hey, for the record, if anyone's gotten this far, you know why I'm encouraging this? Let me tell you the real reason why. It's not that I, I completely understand human nature and tradition and all that. Money is a form of energy. Mm-hmm. Okay, it is a form of energy. And 
and to the extent money is the primary is the second most cause for divorce yes. centers around money. What's number one? And I think when, huh? Number one, what's number one? Sex? Oh, well, no, miss. well, it's sex or and or intimacy. You know, from okay. a woman's perspective, it's intimacy to a man's perspective is not enough sex. So that's number one. And number two, money is like, you know, half is this and half is that. When humans can actually have real conversations about money right from the get-go, just to gain clarity, like from a very first date, I believe it sets the tone for everything going forward. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I believe in not having roles because I believe our big problem today is gender roles. I think when we, if you want to have a soul relationship, None of that stuff matters. By the way, when you're in a soul relationship, both people are paying. You know why? Because they go, I want to show my appreciation. Can I treat this time? No, I want to treat this time. No, I want to treat this time. That's the energy I want to encourage is like, you're always wanting to treat both each other because you're saying you're worth it. That's my, that's my motivation for having this converse, that piece of the conversation. Yeah. I guess I don't know if somebody's worth it on a first date yet though. That's kind of- you know, how do I know? I'm still getting to know. Well, that's that. an interesting. So, so when I say you're worth it, when you come from a place of love, everybody is worth it. Mm -hmm. True. That's very true. I agree. If you, if you want to put, come from a place of love, you want to do that. Like when you can reach that ninja level spirituality, you can go, this is where I operate from. You become a magnetic attractor to what you want. Oh, I think law of attraction or something it works in there too. Yeah, it works in there. Yeah. Maybe that's why no one's ever made me pay on a first date is because I'm so good at law of attraction. Even you said the I word made you pay. Huh? But I want, I want you to go out of your way and you do it. I want That's the thing. I want you to do an experiment. I want I, you to say, oh, you know what? I really had a great I've offered, time with you. Will you I've allow offered. me to treat you? I should go backwards. Okay. I have totally offered. I've offered, but it's never, it's never happened. I've never like... They've, I've, it's never been accepted. And I would have probably, like you no, said- No, you offered to pay half. You didn't offer to pay full. Mm, there's one There, there's one I can remember where I would have wanted to pay the whole thing just so I, to, so let's end this right now. I'm out of here. Yeah, but that, that, that's different reason though. You Very did that for, reason. but that was a different reason. I'm telling you, do something really cool. You have a great date with a guy. I'm just going to give you, try this. You had a great date with a guy. I want you to go to the waiter or waitress, pay for it. Mm -hmm. And and see how he reacts. Well, you know, what? I've, I've done that, just not anger, on a first date. I've totally paid for, I've paid the full bills before. Okay, let me clear. I have paid full bills, but never on a first date. And I thought we we're only talking about first date. By the way, we're tr I'm trying an experiment with you. Yeah, well, I haven't been on a date in a while, so I'll have to let you okay. know. Okay, I'll let me let know. You know. Well, Jonathan, right. it, thank hey, you I gotta so run. much. I know, I knew it would be fun talking to you. Thank you so much for being a Bye. wonderful guest. Bye, All everyone. Right. Big hugs to you. Big hugs. Bye-bye.